you should be getting a notification of that now as well. Um, so if everyone's here, people might join later because we took the waiting room off. So if anyone joins later, then um, of course they, they can follow from where we are there. Uh, but I think we're good to start. Let me start by quickly introducing myself. My name is, is Kyle Grotes. Uh, I work with Rewilding Europe since the beginning of this year. Um, and part of that is um, working with Julia for, for the Young Rewilders. Um, and therefore, uh, I'm also part of, of this meeting. Um, and I'll, I'll give a short introduction about what's going to happen uh, and what to expect. Um, and then we can we can kick it off. Um, so good afternoon, evening, everyone, depending where you are from. Um, welcome uh, to the to the European Young Rewilders webinar. We're very happy that you're all here um, to, to learn about um, rewilding initiatives in Europe from like-minded people as yourself. Um, and we really want to show a few field examples of, of what is possible and, and inspire. Um, maybe what is nice as as kind of a, a start is if you can all mention in the chat function, for those who are not familiar with Zoom, you should be able to find it at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There is a chat uh, to write your age, where you're from, um, and your name, of course, to get a bit of an idea of, of the audience and, and where you're all based. I think it's it's nice to know where we're all speaking from. Um, like I said, I'm uh, Dutch, but I'm in the south of Spain. Um, so the, that's that's mine, but I'm curious to know about yours as well. So if you could write it there, I think that would be nice. Um, and then the meeting, I, I mean, all of us being here, uh, involved with rewilding, we know it's a powerful movement that wants to uh, restore and reconnect ecosystems to bring back biodiversity, um, revitalize our natural world. Um, and because of that, today we have the privilege uh, of hearing from three exceptional speakers who embody the spirit that is part of the whole network that uh, Julia and yourselves have been building. Um, and they've made significant contributions to the cause, which is why um, they're going to present their projects here today. <clears throat> to kick it off, we have Julia herself, who uh, you all know as network coordinator, uh, who will give a brief introduction presentation. Um, Julia's leadership and dedication have been, I think, instrumental in uh, bringing together young rewilders all over the continent, uh, fostering collaboration uh, and promoting the exchange of, of knowledge, experience, exactly like we're doing tonight, which is extremely valuable uh, to connect with, with like-minded people. Uh, after that, we have Noah and Jack. Um, they're from the Young Wilders UK network, and they will be sharing their experiences and insights from leading six nature recovery projects on both public and private land, uh, each encompassing less than 100 acres. Um, and with their work, they're trying to highlight the importance of local action. Um, and that way they can demonstrate how even small scale initiatives can have a substantial impact on, on environment, which is a very important message for, I think, not just us on this call, uh, but us as society. I think it's it's vital. Um, and after that, uh, we'll hear from Søren Bay Kruse Thompson, a student from Denmark joining us today. Um, and Søren made the decision to rewild his family-owned land on the Danish island of Bornholm um, and transform it into an ecotourism project. Uh, and this inspiring journey showcases the potential of rewilding to not just restore the ecosystems, which is in the end the core goal, uh, but also to create sustainable and meaningful experiences for visitors, uh, make make it a a business model, as you as you can say. Um, after the presentation, Julia will ask the presenters a series of questions to delve a bit deeper into the respective projects. Um, throughout the webinar, the goal is to foster a collaborative space uh, to share practices, exchange ideas, uh, address challenges and expectations that we all associate with the term rewilding. Um, and we believe that by bringing together uh, the young rewilders with all various backgrounds, which I'm sure you have, yeah. uh, we hope to inspire each other, learn from each other, uh, and collectively work towards a, a more diverse, resilient future. Um, we had over 60 people sign up last time we checked. Um, usually they don't all join, but still a significant amount representing different countries, different perspectives, uh, which gives us this 
unique opportunity to create connections with people who are not your neighbors, but who share a common goal, uh, which is extremely, extremely nice. Um, before we delve into the presentations that I mentioned, um, I'd like to take a moment to familiarize everyone with Zoom, just in case you're not. I'm pretty sure most of you have worked with it before. Um, if you could make sure to put yourself on mute when you're not presenting so we can prevent any uh, background noise that might be distracting. Uh, we have a designated Q&A session after all the presentations have ended, uh, where you can directly ask your questions. Um, so if you think of anything during the presentations, just, just write it down. There'll be a moment to, to shoot. Um, and to participate, we'll use the uh, raise hand function that Zoom has. Um, and then uh, you can unmute or I can unmute you. And then you can ask your question to the to the presenter you have, you have it for. Um, yeah, and I think that was pretty much it. Then I would like to give the word to uh, Julia, who's gonna gonna kick it off with her with her introduction. And then I Thank have you, to and, let um... me stop sharing, and then I think you can take it over. Yes. So hello everyone. I'm very happy to see so many of you here. Um, I'm just gonna briefly kick it off uh, before. Uh, leaving the floor to our rewilding uh, experts here uh, with some brief considerations when it comes to young people, their role in rewilding, and uh, just mentioning, uh, um, spending some words about the European Young Rewilders Network itself. So, of course, I have a presentation and uh, I will uh, right now share my screen and, uh, and share it. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, write them down and I will be super happy to answer them at the um, at the end of the of the of the presentation. So, uh, why young people? Like, why are we enforcing and making and and highlighting this link between young people and rewilding? Why are we here today? And what is behind the European Young Rewilders itself? So, just by starting off with uh, something that you might think is obvious and not really nice to hear, um, is that our generation has is born into an, env an environmental crisis. We have a planet that has uh, some, some issues and we are facing uh, some challenges. So we are in a context where we have to act or, uh, or adapt. And uh, as young people, we will be asked to make decisions uh, or even sacrifices because of what's going on, because of all these uh, deadlines that are so far in the future that are just uh, putting us, uh, putting the effort, uh, the burden of effort on us uh, in the future. Um, but this can also be quite an empowering moment. And when we speak about rewilding, we see an opportunity as, uh, as you might know, rewilding has entered the European scenario quite recently. So young people, we are really playing uh, an important role in shaping uh, the movement uh, and we are the future of the, of, of the movement just by staying here and discussing about it as well as leading uh, our uh, our uh, our initiatives as the ones we're going to hear from today in this context uh, i think it's important to mention that young people are scholars are professionals we are people with skills we are people with sensitivity to environmental issues um, we have graduated in courses and even working in roles maybe that didn't exist until 20 years ago so this brings us uh, to a very important momentum to try to bring uh, a positive uh, change uh, and rewilding uh, is one of the way how we can do that. You might be familiar with the uh, shift in baseline syndrome. I always like to bring it up because I think it's extremely important when we're talking about young people as we are particularly victims of it. And you can see here the textbook definition um, that says that defines the, the, the shift in baseline syndrome as a gradual change in the accepted norms for the condition of the natural env environment due to the lack of past information or lack of experience of past conditions. What does it mean? It means that whenever we make a decision, we have to pick a, a baseline, a baseline that we want to reach or a baseline that we want to compare what our goal to. And the more we go on in time, the more these uh, baselines are later in the future. And since uh, the environmental degradation trend has been increasing uh, as we go on with time, we tend to be 
as young people, sometimes less ambitious uh, uh, when we enforce or apply the standard we have for the kind of uh, environment we want to see. So you can see here a nice drawing by one of our members that show how, depending what you look at, you have different standards, different goals and different approaches then. And I, I just in general sometimes think about how, you know, the more we go on in time, the more we accept that, uh, for example, some species, uh, some entire group of animals are missing from the natural environment, such as uh, um, grazers. And in general, when we are talking about wildlife come back, we need to be mindful of the time we are looking at and then decide how ambitious uh, we want to be. So I personally think that rewilding can help us overcoming this uh, shift in baseline syndrome because really challenges uh, our traditional uh, choice of baselines and allows us to really imagine a nature that is wilder and, uh, and thriving. The European Young Rewilders was uh, born with the idea of uh, uh, empowering young people to take part in the movement. Currently, we count uh, more than 400 members from 29 European countries. And when I say member, which is can also be said, when I say young rewilder, I mean uh, people that are between 18 to 35 years old that are based in Europe, uh, although they do not require to be Europeans uh, by birth and that are currently engaged in rewilding, as we see some examples today, or want to do so. And uh, I particularly find important the, the second part, uh, so getting uh, in the loop and empowering uh, young people that want to contribute to rewilding. Um, because I personally think uh, that everyone can contribute to rewilding, and this is actually one of the main messages that the network wants to give. As a person with uh, a low background myself, uh, I found my way uh, to contribute to the movement and uh, we really need all the sectors on board. So we have this many people from that are studying uh, different things from many backgrounds and that's totally fine. That's actually what we need to scale up rewilding. We need uh, economists, we need communicators, we need lawyers, we need young people across all these uh, fields with these different passions to bring uh, some rewilding in their daily life, in what we are doing, and with their knowledge, trying to, to support the rewilding movement that touches upon so many different aspects of life, legislation, administration, and so on. Um, for the people that already work in conservation, then, then the reasoning is the same. You don't need to work for a place that has uh, rewilding in the name or in the job description. As long as you are applying the rewilding principles and having the rewilding mindset in your conservation work, then you are a rewilder. So you can see here, and you can also read more about it on our website, uh, uh, our vision, mission, and aim as a network. Uh, um, we want to support the upscaling of rewilding in Europe by specifically engaging young professionals and young people that are enthusiasts to become active players and leaders in the rewilding movement. And in order to do so, our aim is to establish a large and active network where young rewilders from all across Europe can find and share what is needed to engage in rewilding activities, as well as showcase and uh, inspire others, which is also why, why we're here today. So we do have uh, some priorities and some areas where we're focusing as European young rewilders. So um, in particular, when it comes to education, information, awareness raising about what is rewilding, how it can be implemented, what is rewilding Europe doing, how is the status of rewilding in Europe. Um, we are supporting uh, uh, across different aspects, including uh, actual implementation of uh, rewilding actions, uh, matchmaking of, of, of opportunities, uh, and so on. Um, and we do have, uh, as I was just mentioning, this dimension of uh, having a network where people can feel engaged, uh, speak about rewilding with other young rewilders, uh, find information, share best practices, uh, um, and just, uh, you know, literally creating the, the movement itself. And, and lastly, as a network, we, we really care about uh, uh, representation, which means both um, geographical representation, we want rewilding scale up across uh, all Europe, as well as uh, um, speak on behalf of the youth when it comes to um, actions or uh, 
initiatives that are important for rewilding. You, are, you probably heard about our uh, position, the, the position paper that we co-created ahead of the final version of the um, nature restoration law of the European Union. So this is what we do in uh, um, very broad terms. But I think it's important to specify that most of all, we want to inspire people, motivate them, uh, and know and, and make them know that they can do something for rewilding, regardless of what we're doing. So we don't have a blueprint on uh, how you how each of us can go and do rewilding. That's why we create this moment of discussions and we have this platform to to share what we're doing. So with this event, uh, I really hope uh, to that some of you might uh, get some ideas, uh, um, ask uh, questions, uh, but most of all understand uh, that this can be done. So. With this, I would uh, really much just give the floor to uh, to the to the speakers of today. I'm also very excited to know more specific more specifically about their initiatives. Um, so I think uh, um, we can uh, start straight away if, um, hearing from the from the UK, right, Kyle? Yes, yeah, sorry, I was looking for my mute button. Indeed. Right. Um, so yeah, I'll start sharing my screen now. One moment. Okay, sweet. Can people see that? Yeah, works perfectly. Yeah, hell yeah. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, basically, uh, for today, actually, give me one moment. I'm going to read. Yeah, perfect. Um, Noah and I uh, are going to be yapping to you guys, um, and the plan is to give you as full a picture of, as possible in this short time that we have of our journey as an organization, with the vision that that could provide a sort of roadmap to anyone who wants to do something similar, or maybe just provide bits and bobs of info that you can incorporate into your own work elsewhere. Um, a quick thing I'll say is that I am I'm Jack, uh, I'm we're one of the co-founders of Young Wilders, and I lead on the kind of people side of the stuff we do, so the more like engagementy things. Um, I'll let Noah introduce himself when he starts talking. Um, but yeah, so the contents are we're going to do a sort of who, what, why, how type approach. Going to quickly touch on who we are as Young Wilders, both as an organisation and as individuals. Um, and then uh, the kind of stuff we're getting up to, and I'll be talking about that, uh, why we're doing the kinds of things that we're doing. Um, so that's about maybe taking a reflective moment to think about the values that are informing it, maybe some tactical stuff, uh, organizational reasoning. So like why young people, which uh, Julia's already touched on, we'll just add a little bit to that. And then why small part, why a small part? <laughs> And then um, the how are we doing it thing is going to be sort of that roadmap type thought that I mentioned before, um, hopefully give some tips and tricks to anyone that's interested in doing similar kind of stuff. So over to Noah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Noah, also from Young Wilders. Um, if Jack's in charge of the people side of things, like, um, I guess, it puts me in charge of like the numbers and the technical side of things a bit. Um, but basically, like, Young Wilders is a non-profit organization we're, we're currently a, a social enterprise um and planning to become a fully fledged charity in the near future um based in the uk with two key goals uh firstly to accelerate the rewilding of the uk um and to involve young people as much as we can um in the movement um and we are basically a group of friends um who kind of got swept up in the whole like rewilding story um, and yeah, decided that we wanted to enter that space and try and do our own like rewilding project while we're still young. Um, always say like partially selfishly so that we get to see the fruits of our own labor when we're older and we had a, like, yeah, this vision of walking through an area which has been fully rewilded thanks to your work. Um, but just to briefly touch on the team, we kind of have a huge range of skills. Um, like Jack studied philosophy at university and I did engineering, and we've got kind of people more on like business side of things or research and yeah, creatives and a whole bunch. Um, so what we do is basically we've to achieve our two goals, we've set up um it's now eight, I think, if we're going to count them, eight uh, small-scale youth-led nature recovery projects under 100 acres. So, and they, these projects like vary like really significantly. Um, 
I'll give you like two examples. We have like one project in Sussex, which is about 40 acres, so like 16 hectares. Um, there's like a small scale rewilding project where we've been like in some areas planting trees, some areas having some like natural regeneration of trees. We're creating some wetland areas. We've been like moving the animals slowly off the site and yeah, kind of doing a bit of passive rewilding. And those are kind of our bigger scale projects. And then some of the smaller ones, like we've got an urban wildflower meadow we're working on in central London, which is like 200 square meters. So we're kind of doing a big range. Um, and the only other type of project we do is some projects that are just purely about youth engagement. Um, so we run an annual conference uh, at the NEP estate for young people interested in rewilding. Sweet, thanks, Nat. So this is, I'll, I'll skirt over this pretty quick, but this was just to kind of sketch out a bit more of our story. Um, so we started chatting about this stuff in 2018. First project uh, was in 2020. Then next project wasn't until late 2021, I think. And then I started working on this full time just every year ago. Then Noah joined about a year ago, full time. Um, and the reason why I wanted to mention this stuff was to highlight how slow progress is. And this is kind of a thing in conservation more broadly, which you guys would have already butted heads with, I imagine. Um, and then add to that, just the fact getting your own thing started always takes just an absolute age. And the first few years, really nothing was happening. So I guess the, the thing to take from this, uh, at least in my head, is that uh, if you do try anything like this, um, just like be ready for things to feel like low momentum. I'd say maybe 80 to 90% of everything that we've ever done has been in the last year. So momentum does build, which is great. Um, so yeah, the getting into the why stuff now. Um, basically, yes, yeah, so we had those two aims that we've discussed. Uh, one sec. Yeah, okay. So we had those two aims that we've just discussed. And then we kind of dove into the rewilding sphere via pestering people, basically just emailing as many people as we could for chats, doing lots of visits of kind of famous projects in the UK, some of which you might have heard of, like NEP, Wild Ken Hill, Allerdale, things like that. Um, and basically tried to just gather as much intel about where our efforts could be most useful. Um, and basically what we kind of found through our, I suppose, research, but losing, using that term pretty loosely, was there were two kind of pockets of energy that we felt weren't being tapped into. So one was just meeting loads of young people who wanted to do this work for reasons that we'll touch on later. And obviously just very intuitive reasons, like it's just super fun, for example. And then also lots of small uh, holder, small, <laughs> small holders, uh, people that own not very much land, who really wanted to do this work, were re really keen on it. But um, the major rewilding organizations in the UK at the time, for example, Rewilding Britain, had policies of only focusing on larger plots. So they weren't getting any attention, they weren't getting resources, they weren't getting any help. And we felt like we could sort of turn this faucet in our head that could connect these two balls of energy and then facilitate a lot of rewilding that wasn't happening. Um, but yeah, I thought we could, for the next slides, dive into why we think this is an important faucet to turn. So why getting young people involved and smallholders involved is important. So I'm going to I'm going to go through this quickly because uh, Julia already touched on this uh, very well, and also it's also just pretty self-evident stuff too. But the first thing is kind of a practical slash tactical thing. Young people just want to do this stuff. There's a UK Gov statistic that we sling around from a survey back in 2021, which was 81% of young people in the UK. I think their definition is like 15 to 25 or something are eager to take action to help the environment, which is a massive statistic that any other generation. I, I, they don't have the stats on baby boomers, but I imagine it would be much lower than that. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Then there's the currently excluded thing. There's some scary stats here about only one in five young people in the UK believe they're being listened to on environmental issues or adequately involved in their solving. Um, and that's a pretty scary statistic. So that exclusion is, is a little bit worrying. And then um, chance to upskill, that's a straightforward thing. We need young people with the skills and the know-how to, to help us get out of this crisis. Um, higher stake is the thing Julia already said. We have the most minutes coming at us living on this earth. So it, like help, having some role in saving it feels appropriate. <laughs> and then also true sustainability is just kind of a dramatic term that we sometimes say which is about if you want sustainability to be sustainable, you have to involve young people. It's, it just doesn't make, it literally wouldn't be sustainable otherwise. And there's a sense in which all long-term failures in conservation and environmentalism can be traced back to failures in engaging and teaching the next generation. 
Um, so yeah, that's like that's another reason why we take the young stuff really seriously. Uh, Noah is now going to talk a little bit about probably what's the slightly more controversial component of our two aims, which is the focus on small plots. He's going to go over our reasoning and some issues that people might take with it, including us, issues that we've noticed. Yeah, sorry to bombard everyone with numbered lists, but it's just how, <laughs> how that frames works. Um, so yeah, like we work pretty much, well, we work exclusively with small plots, which we say is like under a hundred acres. Um, and like, there's many reasons why that's like become our, our, our mission, um, which, you know, might change in the future. But for now, I feel like we can really serve an important role um, in that sphere. Um, firstly, like if you add all of these parcels up, they're, they're huge. Um, you've got the stat that's like, if you add up all the, small like farm holdings in the UK under 50 hectares. It's like one and a half times the size of Wales. Um, apologies to Wales to always being a measurement of area, nothing else, <laughs> but, um, uh, but it's obviously huge. And um, yeah, I don't know, kind of come across these parcels quite a lot in the UK landscape. Um, and like secondly, I mean, you know, how much you want to take from this, but we basically believe that the, the correlation between area and biodiversity is like maybe over slightly in the rewilding movement and people are saying how big their project is um rather than you know what they've actually delivered on their project and you know one perfectly rest restored pond could you know bring more biodiversity benefits than like acres and acres of kind of poorly restored grassland um here and the third point is about connectivity um i think Obviously, rewilding would be great if we can have as much of it as possible. But there's definitely like other land uses which need their space, you know, like, like farming, um, renewable power generation, all of these things. So, like, we need to fit it in where we can, and we need to connect these parcels together. Um, the picture in here, you can't see it very well, but like this is an example of a small holding we're working on. It's just three fields, um, but to the north, um, the northwest is just that amazing area of like ancient woodland and there's more beyond that and there's farms in the middle so we want to restore this and help create a network in that in that area um the next point we found about these small plots is that there's no limit or there might be limits to their kind of biodiversity potential we haven't found yet any limit to their kind of like engagement potential like you can have hundreds and hundreds of people coming to visit these small plots and you know once you're surrounded by you know, a few fields, you can still feel like deeply immersed within a rewilded landscape. Um, and so our kind of engagement and youth engagement, like kind of per area, we don't really see a limit to that. Um, so that's a huge plus. Um, and the final point, it's like more practically, these small parcels, especially in the UK, often um, because of their size, they're not the landowner's primary source of income. Um, Often they're not even farmed, they're just kind of managed like with habitual management or grazing. Um, and um, yeah, well, this basically gave us an in to work with some of these people. This is not in their, their entire livelihood. Maybe it's part of it, maybe it's not at all. Um, so we get a bit of freedom on these small plots to let young people work um, and experiment and not have someone's livelihood be the result of any mistake which yeah is, is a nice feeling um and just kind of to pre-answer anyone's questions like we know that small plots have got like a lot of limitations like we notice all the time how you know inefficient that it can be and how, how much time and energy you need to put in um per project per size um yeah I'd, I'd say basically hours in and finances in like it really becomes kind of less and less efficient the smaller you go as we found with the project we're working with in central london it's literally a tiny pocket of wildflower meadow but it's taken as long as to organize as a like well, almost as long as like a you know 20 acre rewilding project and the stick somewhere um like the second pitfall we found we, we kind of talk about this like poor status of um plots which in my head i kind of think about as like populations being able to sustain themselves like on a single like parcel of land and kind of i'd say that none of our projects 
are big enough for kind of entire populations to be sustained. Um, so if you do have a particular type of insect or butterfly which comes and makes a home on your project, um, it will be quite vulnerable because if it's kind of isolated from other areas where it has suitable habitat and it's just trying to live on your small plot, if something happens, an extreme weather event or something, it could be it could be wiped out or no longer live in that area. And then and secondly, um, you kind of don't have big enough space for like megafauna populations to kind of have the appropriate grazing that they need. So we, if we ever use animals, they have to come in and then they have to go out and they, you can't have a kind of sustainable population. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep going through my numbered list. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, just in, in general, we kind of like the projects are limited by their size. Um, there's a lower biodiversity in that sense where you probably have a smaller range of habitats. We don't have enough space to reintroduce different species. Um, you know, there's only so many trees that can grow on our land. So our kind of carbon impact potential is limited in that way. Um, the fourth point is a really interesting one that like me and Jack have had to deal with the loads in like dealing with landowners is that these kind of small plots of land are very like important to people and often the landowners we work with it'd be like maybe you know some fields that have been passed down like through their family and kind of been managed in a certain way for a long time and yeah people were just like really really invested in them and really want to see them prosper and like deliver as much good as possible which can obviously be a, a positive but can also be a big challenge because that person has a set of expectations and doesn't want, yeah, I don't know, it, it is very concerned and invested in the parcel. So if, if you make a mistake, you can kind of feel more than just like a mistake, you make it work. It's like a mistake with someone's life. Um, and the fifth point is kind of maybe a more of a legal point. We set up agreements with all our landowners in a kind of sh a short term, in terms of rewilding basis, like five year, three year agreements for us to come and do the management of um, of parcels and kind of longer term like covenants and protection strategies often don't apply to parcels this small or are so expensive for the lawyers to make them that it wouldn't really be beneficial. Um, so we're definitely aware of the risk that we're taking in the fact that some of these small parcels one day could be sold for a development and we wouldn't really have any any way to deal with that. Great. Um, so yeah, the, I'm excited to delve into that stuff a bit more in the discussion section if we have time, because um, loads of really interesting debates in there. Um, and I'm sure we're all on the same team and agreeing it's like better than it not happening, but definitely like where's wise to put our resources is always an important conversation. Um, so yeah, we discussed who we are, what we do, why we do it. So we're going to go into the how stuff. Um, this is, yeah, a bit of a visual onslaught coming in here about the kind of stuff that we've been getting up to the last uh, couple of years. Um, and I think my point with machine gunning these photos at you guys was just to highlight the diversity of activities involved in the kind of work we do. Um, I imagine you probably would have guessed this, but there's just like a lot of emails, a lot of grant writing, a lot of filling out spreadsheets. Um, this actually makes it look a bit more outdoorsy than it actually is. It's closer to just a kind of standard office job in practice, um, presentations, mapping, technical, ecological work, volunteer days, all this kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, obviously a lot of this stuff is very straightforward. You guys will have already done this in your work, I imagine, or at least be able to intuit, intuit it easily. So I thought the most sensible thing to focus on in our kind of broader how, uh, and in my head now speaking to us from a few years ago, like the things we were most ignorant uh, of when we began, uh, is one, how to fund this kind of work, uh, and two, how to get the project set up, and maybe more specifically, how to make contact with these landowners in the first place. Uh, so those are the two things that we're going to focus on now. Uh, funding is no. Yeah, I'll pick up my job as boring numbers person um, and I'll let Jack talk about the exciting stuff. Um, basically, yeah, like we fund, we always talk about trying to have like a diversity of funding with um, our projects. Um, I'm going to walk you around my pie chart clockwise quickly because kind of in order of time of where we've got to as well. So like when we first started, we were just friends doing this on the side while we were working at university. We won a few like project specific grants to cover, you know, like specific capital costs, like, you know, a thousand trees or a bag of wildflower seeds. 
and we got that for free and then boom went off to go and do the project um with, you know, donating our time and you know putting in like all of those hours and then kind of as we developed and grow more projects we kind of started winning these like unrestricted grants from like bigger grant giving organizations and philanthropists um and that's grant money which you can do whatever you want with it's like unrestricted which we've been using to like start to pay our salaries and um yeah other things which you might not be able to fund so easily elsewhere um and then like as our journeys continued like in the christmas of last year we started taking public donations to um try and get people's christmas generosity and like we did quite well out of, out of that um and it's kind of all come off the back of kind of growing enough projects and enough of a story that you know, people are interested and, and want to keep us going um and then our last piece of the pie which is getting bigger and bigger um is like payments from landowners um so when we first started we offered this for free for landowners we were like if you let us rewild your land like we'll do everything else like we'll, we'll you know we'll do all the fundraising you don't have to pay us just please let us do this um but now we've done um, we're not done this ongoing now i have a bit of experience in the sector we started charging the landowners um like a little bit of, of money to contribute to the project um just because we've seen how much good can be delivered through these small scale projects both in terms of the land improvement and like engagement stuff um so yeah this is the kind of connecting with landowners thing like i mentioned which um we definitely found to be kind of like learning on the job the most um so hopefully this will be useful for you guys so yeah there's obviously two ways this could happen <laughs> you could approach them or they could approach you and then for the you approaching them which is how it would happen uh or how it has happened for us uh, most frequently especially early on this tends to be how it goes down um there's the step one, yeah, finding them. So personal links, this straightforward thought of just like, is there anyone that knows anyone? Have you heard of anyone that owns any land? Do you know anyone that's on a council that's mentioned they have some land they don't know what to do with? Uh, all that kind of stuff. Instagram and socials, there's a lot of these uh, projects in the UK, at least. I wonder if this is a thing on the continent as well. Uh, often have some kind of internet presence about them, whether stating some intention of doing rewilding or they already uh, kind of doing this kind of stuff with some public facing uh, component. So obviously finding them through those means is pretty wise too. And then finally, uh, pestering landy organizations. So this is just like big nature organizations in your country, councils, churches in England is a good one, property developers as well. People who are just like in contact with landowners or own land themselves. Um, and yeah, just get the conversation going because they might know of someone who has an intention to do something or maybe there's a biodiversity net gain thing going on, that kind of stuff. And then more the merrier thought is just like, message so many people like literally like a hundred and then maybe you'll get one reply and then you're good to go this is imagining that you want to do our um, model at all obviously but like the, we found that just like messaging a lot of people has has worked um and then yeah I'll, I'll blast through this other stuff it's all pretty straightforward i would say the most important thing in the contact once you've made contact the establishing value alignment is massive that's been like a really defining component of the work that we've done um, and what we mean by that is we have this youth engagement thing, we have this public facing thing, we want all of the land that we work on to be open to the public, so public footpaths going through them, or an, or an owner who lets people on their land, that kind of thing. Um, and sometimes we've spoken to landowners who don't want either of those things, or both, and then we don't work with them. It's really important to like establish at the outset, I guess it kind of goes without saying, but so you don't run into problems further down the line. So there was two instances where we had difficulties that were kind of relating to the value alignment stuff um and then establish but yeah i mean this is all pretty straightforward you guys know how to do this sounds like most of you are ecologists you'll know what the best kind of interventions would be or at least have access to people that might know the funding thing is just a chore you've just got to hit up trusts you've got to check local councils to see if they have budget for this in the uk there's lottery funding larger nature charities can help also crowdfunding is an option but that is a very time consuming so we probably wouldn't recommend that um and then the option two is uh, basically everything's the same except for the finding you thing. We just, these are things that I, I imagine, again, you guys will probably already know, but we kind of learned the hard way. Take your internet presence really, really seriously and not in the sense of being kind of stoic or like, I, I don't know, like over professional or anything, but just make it just like kind of attractive and interesting. It's kind of more of a marketing point, I suppose. But if you, if you can make yourself like intriguing, that's going to allow you to do more of the kind of work that you want to do. 
uh, relatedly document everything you're doing, demonstrate all the good work you've done. And then, yeah, the louder you are, the more people you're talking to, the more things you're doing where you're just like getting the word out, the more likely you are to obviously be able to do this, these kinds of projects. Um, and we just wanted to finish with some more kind of reflections on things that we've learned. Again, I'll kind of blast through this. So progress I mentioned really slow uh, for a long time. And that was really disheartening. There was a period just for a quick overshare of about three months where I was working on this mainly by myself. And all I was doing was working on this one invasive species case on one of our sites. And it was so, so boring. It was like really difficult. I mean, it was, it was, it was thrilling in some ways. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm, I'm being too cruel to that period, but it was like, uh, it was difficult. And there were definitely moments where I was like questioning whether this is something that I wanted to do. But ever, since then, every component of that project and others has been really good so hang in there I guess golden hearted landowners we've discussed just people with, who have the same values as us who want to do this work and they don't mind if they're not making money that's amazing coal hearted landowners is maybe an unfair description but this was just the term we were using to refer to the ones where the value misalignment is there and they're perhaps only interested in rewilding for like like maybe it's more profit orientated all of that's still really worthwhile but it's just not anything that we have expertise in so yeah, really unfair term there. Uh, just basically just find the people that have the same kind of goals as you, I suppose. Um, people want to help, loads of volunteers, loads of experts. We're doing a really fun, interesting and good thing and involving people in that is awesome. Um, leveraging everything you can, we've already discussed that in the landowner context. Um, just like every person you know who you think could add something, just like pest them to help what happens. Uh, then, Doc, yeah, we already discussed that. A final thing that we wanted to say was, um, at least in the UK, there's a really big kind of culture war component to rewilding, which is really interesting. And it it's kind of varies regionally as well. It's like especially a big thing in Wales, for example. But the general way that it gets framed, at least by the news, is kind of like urbanite, out of touch, rewilders caught up in the romance, wanting to like storm in to kind of uh, long-standing, like culturally significant farming areas and just like, undermine food security while destroying culture and things like that. Um, but yeah, what we've noticed in practice is that obviously rewilders like want there to be food and want there to be food security and take food production really seriously. Um, and also farmers just take nature recovery very seriously. Uh, and as in tune with the seasons and with nature as like any demographic of person, the only reason why, at least in the UK, they haven't been able to help nature in the way that a lot of them we've spoken to want to is just because the money isn't there, like the government isn't subsidizing that kind of work. But now they are, which is awesome. So this kind of false, like adversarial dichotomy is kind of eroding anyway. But we just wanted to mention that we've found it to just not be a thing. And it's a bit of a shame that that's a narrative that some components of at least the UK media push. Um, and then, yeah, discussion stuff we'll get to. I think we went pretty long over our time allotment, so sorry about that. But yeah, excited to hear from Soren. Thank you so much, guys. Fantastic stuff. Um, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, we'll jump straight into Soren's presentation. If... Absolutely. Hold on. Let me just get it up for a moment here. If I can mention as well, if you have any questions about the presentation you just saw, the presentation coming up, write them down. And like mentioned before, there's time at the end to, to ask whatever is on your mind. All right. Hi, everyone. So uh, I'll be talking today about essentially a family run initiative that we are doing on the island of Bonhol uh, called Xelgo. Uh, Xelgo is a small estate of about uh, 26 hectares, or in acres, I think that's found. 60, 70 acres or something like that. And essentially, um, the way this rewilding initiative came about was my mother and her husband, my stepfather, uh, decided that they wanted to move to the countryside. Uh, they're getting up there in age. It's sort of their idea for an idyllic retirement plan. So they brought up, they bought uh, a little a little manor, um, peasant's place. Um, and it came with 26 hectares of land. So the rewilding kind of followed from that. Rewilding was never sort of the original aim of getting this land. But since it was there, the discussion was, what are we going to do with this land? And the answer was, we're going to rewild it. So essentially, we, we bought the estate in April of 2022. So we've had it for just over a year now. And the idea essentially is to run a bit of a mini net. I'm sure most of you are familiar with NET, 
but essentially the idea is take the land, rewild it, and hopefully that will give um, added value to the property you already have. And then part of that property will be rented out as holiday stays. So essentially tying an economic model to the rewilding project. Now, if you look on the slide here, you'll see sort of a, a rough map of the area. Everything within red bounds is our land. And it's very nice because it consists of a lot of different land use types. So the sort of, uh, you can see there are two major fields, one in the north, one in the south. They're both were wheat when we, when we took over them. Production started, uh, the production of wheat stopped in August. So uh, this will be the first year in which they'll be growing with wild vegetation. On top of that, we have uh, mostly oak forest dominating, but also uh, some plantation forest. Uh, there's also a large lake attached and some smaller sort of open nature areas. Here are a couple of pictures from there, uh, to sort of breeze through them. We do have some, uh, some lovely aesthetic little places, uh, including some nice bird life. Yeah, we're located on the island of Bonholm, uh, which uh, I don't know if all of you know where that is, but that's it's an island situated between uh, Sweden and Germany, but uh, owned by Denmark. On the island, we're sort of near the north tip. This geography is quite significant uh, uh, because essentially this is a very touristed island. So if we talk about sort of the business model before of uh, running something that's to do with holiday homes and tourism, well, we're kind of perfectly situated to run a model like that. So yeah, um, we also wanna drive, do a little bit of uh, sustainable food production on the side. We have some livestock, we'll get into that in a second. But in terms of the actual rewilding, our plan is to take the forested areas and just maintain them essentially. There are light open oak forests already, gorgeous nature, uh, pretty much just want to keep that. But for the more open areas, we want to create what is called a vera landscape, which is essentially a sort of this very variated, beautiful landscape consisting of open areas, but also bushland and trees. And it's kind of um, very much in the spirit of, of, of Net Wildland in the UK. Uh, we renovated the main house. So we essentially got uh, three sort of um, sides. To the house uh, and then we'll, the idea is one side is going to be holiday homes one side will be uh, where my parents live and third side is an old barn which we would like to uh, to repurpose into um, essentially like an event place where uh, companies could come and rent it uh, do talks or meetings or events whatever they feel for in terms of the actual rewilding project itself, we have uh, fenced in 23 hectares of the area where we are going to, uh, where we've introduced Galloway cattle. We've got about four adults, four sub-adults, and uh, just the other day we got our first calf, which is very exciting. Um, and hopefully next month we'll uh, be supplementing that with Shetland ponies. So we'll have two grazers running uh, side by side within the area. And 2020, in the winter of 2022, we had to uh, supplement them with extra fodder because well, there wasn't anything growing on the fields because it had just been harvested. But we hope that the concentrations of wild stocks, which we'll be using, will be uh, low enough that they can actually sustain themselves over the winter on the vegetation there. But of course, we don't want the animals to starve. We're very keen on keeping good animal welfare. So if there is a problem with food availability, we will of course supplement feeding. Uh, we're also looking at a small uh, hydrological restoration project. So essentially there is an, an old, uh, probably 100 year old uh, stone drain, which is draining most of our main field. And we're currently in the process of getting a permission to uh, essentially dig that up and remove it, restore uh, a nice little stream that we can see on historical maps used to be there, but has, has long since disappeared. We, had, we came with a few hectares of spruce plantation, and here we took the decision that we were, instead of trying to rewild it, we were going to harvest it, and then we were going to let natural regeneration take its course. And we did this for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, spruce plantation doesn't have a lot of nature value. Uh, you, you could do an effort to rewild it, but we didn't see much of a point. But second of all, it was a great funding mechanism to sell off all this timber that 
doesn't have much of a biodiversity value in this case anyway to help fund things like uh, fencing for livestock and sort of the other um, costs that uh, come with setting up a rewilding project. So buying livestock, uh, we had the renovation to think of. So essentially we wanted to run that into the funding mechanism essentially, but we were quite strategic about it. So if you, if you look sort of at the pic picture number two here, you can see wherever there was a hole in the spruce plantation where we found a deciduous tree, we tried to leave, ask the foresting companies to leave it be. So we had lots of uh, sort of old birch trees and a few oaks as well that uh, could stand there. And that means when sort of when you get regeneration within this area, when you start to get grasses and bushes up, you also have a bit more 3D structure because you have the trees there. Uh, we also left a few spruce trees, but uh, as you can see in picture three, uh, most of them didn't stay standing. Got knocked over uh, in storms, uh, but that's fine too. That means we have some lying deadwood, and uh, when the roots go up, it leaves these little, nice little puddles, small little local wetland areas. So we take it all in stride. Uh, there was also some ex excess deadwood left over from uh, when we did the logging. So what we essentially done is you, you get these leftover stumps. We've essentially just put them at the edge of the habitat, left them in piles to sort of make insect hotels. And that's kind of been our solution for what to do with that so far, because stumps don't look very aesthetic when you put them around in the landscape, but put them in piles, you have a little interesting experiment going. That's, that's the idea anyway. But in terms of sort of smaller trees that got knocked over and haven't been taken, we essentially chosen to move them from the, the, uh, the spruce plantations and move them out into our, uh, our fields. And the idea there is essentially to create a bit of variation in the landscape because a wheat field is very homogenous. And next year, it's still going to be quite homogenous because variation in vegetation takes many years to uh, sort of generate. So we thought, you know, take some uh, dead trees out there and maybe it'll create some shelter for, uh, for uh, plant species where they won't become grazed and that can sort of give way to bushland a bit faster. That's the idea anyway. Uh, we also hope in the future to take some of the, the stones that have been moved away from the agricultural areas and bring them back into the landscape. Again, we, we want to create variation locally, both in, in water conditions, in, you know, in stones, in vegetation, and all of this we're basically starting from scratch. One of the big problems on our site is bracken. Uh, bracken, for those of you who aren't familiar, essentially it's it's actually it is a native plant to uh, to northern Europe, but it is so dominant in certain habitat types that it it leaves out such a it leaves out these interesting uh, open forest uh, undergrowths because it just it grows over everything and shades it out completely, um, and livestock won't eat it because it's toxic. So what do you do in that situation? Well, nature's solution, or or sort of rather the natural way this would have uh, been consumed is wild boar. Uh, now we don't have any wild boar in Bornholm. We basically don't have wild boar in Denmark at all. So the alternative would be to use pigs. That's kind of an ambition for us in the long term. Uh, we don't have any at the moment. It requires very expensive fencing and there are a lot of legal complications. So in the meantime, the I've sort of touched on two possible solutions. The first one is we've introduced salt licks into the dense groves. And the idea there is for the cattle and eventually the horses to seek out these salt licks and trample the bracken underfoot. Hopefully create, um, hopefully quash the vegetation and leave room for um, trees to establish where possible. And secondly, uh, around the periphery of the bracken groves, we want to essentially cut them twice a year uh, to prevent them from spreading. But this is kind of a strategy that runs counter to sort of the principle of rewilding. And this is where sort of using a small scale and having a limited budget kind of, it, it complicates how many natural processes you can bring back in. I think we'll have some discussion about that later, but it's, it's scale is a very important thing to think about in uh, small projects. We cleaned up, there was a lot of um, rubbish lying around. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. There's a lot of, hunting on the on the estate before we got there and just lots of cartridges and 
or peasant coup, which was not entirely legal. Um, and just honestly, junk that's probably a hundred years old, just been lying out there for a long time. So we went out and cleaned that up. I've also done a little bit of monitoring. Uh, this was actually the part of the topic of my master's thesis. But essentially what we've done is we've we've done some botanical richness analyses. We've kind of looked at where is our bracken located. But I think most significantly is in 2022, we did what's called a bio blitz, which is essentially you invite in as many volunteers as want to come. You give them 24 hours and they get to log as many species in the area as they can. And we have some, in Denmark, we have some software where you can essentially uh, record any species you find, send a picture in and it registers it. So we can see that from doing our bio blitz in 2022, uh, we managed to record, I think it was about 800 species of everything from uh, mostly plants and insects, but you know, lichens, um, fungi, birds, you name it. Uh, and we hope to then look at that again and to try to get do that again in 2025. So we can sort of see over a three year time span, how has our community changed? You know, is it the same fungi species we're seeing? Are we seeing different plant species? Has the bird community shifted? Uh, we're not so much thinking in terms of sheer number because it's, it really depends, you know, how many people do you have coming to a bio blitz? Which experts are there, et cetera, et cetera. But we can, by looking at the same taxonomic group, you can kind of get an idea of how, how the conditions are shifting. Are we seeing more rare species? Are we seeing species uh, that are consistent with different habitat types? So we're very eager to see in a few years how that's gonna um, shape up. So that's pretty much it for the project. Um, if you wanna follow us, we do have a, a, fa a page both on Facebook and Instagram called uh, Shadegal Countryside Lodge. Uh, we will have a website soon, but it's not been created yet. And in terms of holiday accommodation, uh, we open up uh, next month, actually. And we're very eager to see if we're going to get a, uh, a lot of popularity with it and get any success. So it's, it's all exciting. Uh, if you have any questions about um, the company or bookings, you can reach out to my mother at the email below. Or if it's anything related to rewilding, you can just shoot me an email at, at, at that address. Um, or if you're part of the European Young Rewilders, you can also just message me on Telegram. That's fine too. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I guess we'll save the questions for when it becomes relevant. Thank you so much, Jordan. Another fantastic initiative. A great presentation. Thank you. Um, I think, Julia, this is uh, the time for your questions to delve a bit deeper into, into some of the details. Yes, well, <clears throat> thank you to all the speakers. And despite I speak a lot with Soren, Jack and Noah, every time I listen to their initiatives, I hear something new. And especially after Soren presentation, I'm more than excited to go and visit in uh, in July. Actually, I'm doing that because as soon as I heard about that, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go. I'm I'm based in Southern Sweden. I didn't mention that, so very close to, to Bornholm. Um, anyway, um, so the reason why we are here today, and here I'm referring to the broader audience. And the reason why the European Young Rewilders was creating the first time is because uh, we are getting, as young people, more and more enthusiastic about rewilding. Uh, we hear about rewilding, that hit a button, and uh, we want to do something. So my question to the speakers, and now and Jack, you can decide uh, which one of you picks the uh, the question, or if you can, if you want, you can answer both. Is what motivated you to start this initiative? What was like the, the process from the first time you heard about rewilding to go to your fellow young people or to your parents in case of Sore and say, you know what, I'm going to rewild it. How, how did that work out for you? Maybe we can both do an answer of some kind. Um, I can, I'll kick it off. Um, so I guess I guess we kind of touched on this a little bit with that uh, fairly tortured like faucet analogy that I was talking about in the sense of like just coming across uh, like young people who wanted to do this and then coming across landowners who wanted it to happen. And then I guess seeing ourselves as a sort of facilitator of like getting those two groups together. I would say taking it back a step though, uh, why we were drawn to rewilding in the first place, um, as opposed to like any other environmental movement, 
um, was how much like hope there was in it. I imagine this is something that will resonate with um, other people here as well. We just got, at least in my environmental studies masters I did, you just get bombarded with such like punishingly depressing stuff. I was working in chemical pollution in the research area I was doing, and that's a really disheartening area because it just isn't getting anywhere near the attention that it needs to. Um, so I guess I kind of cowardly <laughs> just run away from that towards the bright light of rewilding because it is, um, it's so future focused. It has so much energy in it right now. Um, and it's like one of the few narratives, which is like painting a picture of like a more beautiful ecological future, which is like obviously the really attractive thing to be a part of. Yeah, I can say, I mean, yeah, similar motivations just kind of got swept up in the good vibes of um, rewilding. And um, yeah, I don't know, I was working for like a couple of years in that big engineering practice, like doing some good work, like working on like rivers and wetlands and things, but mostly like in relation to like the, like the housing industry. And I was just like, oh, am I gonna have to wait like 20 or 30 years until I can do the kind of projects I actually want to do like, or could I just could we just do it right now um and yeah that's pretty big pretty big motivator yeah for me uh motive I mean rewilding I've been very interested in for many years uh I came I came into rewilding through paleontology actually which is a bit of an unorthodox route but I, I always loved prehistory and so I kind of saw the missing elements from the modern day. So rewilding has been an interest for many years. And then I read uh, Wilding by Isabella Tree, which I'm sure probably many of you have read, or if not, I strongly recommend reading it. And it told the story of, of, of Net Wildland, of how they took sort of unproductive, um, this unproductive farming land and turned it into uh, both really biodiverse, really beautiful, with so many conservation successes, and then a good business model to boot. And so when I heard my parents were, or actually it's before that, I, I started talking to my mother about it and showed her the book and she was just as inspired as I was. So when my uh, mother decided they were gonna move to the countryside and there was land attached, it was kind of a, a no brainer. Uh, that book definitely was a large part of the inspiration of not just to rewild, but also how we were going to do it. Yes, well, thank you for your uh, for your answers. I I think it's important also to bring up these uh, perspectives so that uh, the rest of the young people that are not currently directly involved in rewilding can understand that at the end of the day we are all going throughout the same process. So it's just about funding uh, the way you can contribute it, and inspiration can comes can come very very quickly, very suddenly as well, um, even by just reading a book. But then it has to be it, it has to translate into something and it is possible to translate into something um now moving a bit from to the other direction uh, um you started your initiative uh, you're happy about it uh, you're involving other people and you're here today speaking about, about it uh, but what is that you would define as the main challenge that you're encountering uh, with your project now uh, some of you actually all of you quite mention uh, mention them a bit but if you could pick one or maybe two that are the main ones which one would you point out um i may go in just as that's what happened last time the uh so i'd say stuff that you think could be a problem but at least in the uk hasn't been is that public support is is so big for rewilding in the uk and even a few years ago noticeably was less so that's been a kind of easier component we're always kind of pitching to a home crowd which is really good um i would say there's a lot of there's also a lot of money there now which we've spoken to conservationists who've been around for a long time that hasn't been true ever in conservation until very recently at least in the uk but that said i would say the biggest problem that we face is is getting grant money and not that it isn't available, but just like funding our operation takes up so much of our time, like really like a lot of hours and a lot of like emotional energy as well. Um, so I guess in an ideal, I'm not sure exactly how things will play out, but a dream scenario would be for that to be kind of less challenging <laughs> and for us to have like a, a larger sums of money from less organizations. It's a bit of a classic in the nonprofit charity sector, but that's probably what I would say is the biggest challenge. Yeah. Um... I'd probably just pick another challenge, like 
managing the the people involved in what we do like we work with we work with landowners like all around the uk and in some of the like one of our plots is like a community owned piece of land that has like 20 different landowners just for like one field and like everyone and just managing people's expectations like and i don't know set like just yeah managing people's like expectations and time and what it's going to look like and what you can actually feasibly achieve and how much it's going to cost and and people wanting to have their stamp on the project i think it's been a bit of a yeah it's been a big challenge to manage um we're slowly getting there by maybe trusting ourselves a bit more um in what we're saying but i think at the start i are doing a lot of like just saying yes to people that we can we can do things which maybe weren't possible um so yeah that's been a big challenge Yeah, and uh, for us, I think the the biggest challenge we've run into so far, we're still early days, so we've only been at this for about a year, and the actual renting starts next year. The rewilding efforts, in truth, only really started in the autumn, so we're still learning a lot as we go along. But so far, the most uh, the most headache-inducing part of the project has been uh, legislation, like ar archaic laws that are just really, really difficult to deal with. As an example, in Denmark, we have a law called the, the forestry law um, or the, the forest law. It's a law from the early, the late 1700s. And the law basically states that certain areas that are forest have to be forest and they always need to be forest, but not just do they need to be forest, they need to have, I think it's 80% forest cover and it needs to be high value trees that stand that that are there so when you're trying to create sort of a more mosaic landscape i mean that's just it, it's very difficult because you you can't just leave the processes to go wild because that's illegal so you have to go in and do micromanagement you might have to say okay if this area isn't turning naturally into woodland we'll have to fence it so we can get enough trees to go and only then put the animals back in and we have a similar problem in our agricultural areas. They're still legally defined as agricultural areas, so they have to be predominantly open. So if we get any, if we get any uh, significant amount of growth there of trees or bushes, we're gonna have to uh, to peel that back to go in and actively cut it. It's just, it's so unnecessary. But you know, the law is the law. We have to stay on on the right side of it. Yes, fun that you mentioned that because I actually wrote my master thesis on how to integrate the re rewilding approach into into European law. And uh, yeah, that conversation, I mean, not that specifically about the case of Denmark, but this issue comes up quite, of, quite often. Um, as my last question, because I really want to give the audience the chance to speak up if they want, uh, um, it's quite related to what I just asked, actually, now that I think about it. Um, but what is an advice then you would give to a person uh, uh, that wants to start rewilding, well, a young person, so with, you know, the limited uh, resources, time, capacity, even knowledge that has, uh, which advice would you give to this person to start rewilding their own land or the land of someone else that they know, that they inherited, or, yeah, even if it's, even if they want to approach someone to find land to conduct their, their, their project? I'm gonna go first on this one just to mix up mix up the order. Um, I'd say, like first of all, like just like like do it, like you know, like be confident and like, yeah, like definitely it's something that's like super rewarding and you probably won't regret it if you if you do manage to do it. Um, and then yeah, probably like the advice would be like don't be maybe intimidated by. I don't know, a perceived lack of skills or or knowledge compared to like really experienced people. Like in general, like rewilding principles are quite simple. Um and I think, yeah, having having a, a mind a fresh mindset with that can be really helpful. Even when, when sometimes when we talk to I don't know, older conservationists, they, they they can't quite engage with those principles as quickly as younger people can. So um yeah, I'd back yourself. Um with your own kind of understanding. 
If I may just jump in real quick, because also if you want to self-educate you, a new book just dropped that's basically going through all the principles of rewilding. So if you are looking to rewild your own land and need some practical advice, there's a new book out called The Book of Wilding, which is basically just, it's just a tool set of how do you rewild land at any scale. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have much to add to that. I'm also reading the Book of Wilding at the moment, and it's really excellent stuff. It's like very thorough. Um, and yeah, it's from the Isabella Tree, who and Charlie Wilde, who did the next stuff. So definitely people at the center of the movement. Um, the I guess one thing I'm, that Noah and I have spoken about previously is just like maintaining and embracing the beginner's mindset, which is just like, always be willing to ask questions all the time and don't worry about looking foolish or whatever. Um, we had environmental backgrounds like Noah discussed, but they weren't specifically ecological ones. And just from the maybe, I guess, getting on to three years, um, depending where you draw the line, that we've been in the game, we've just been pestering people for wisdom that whole time. Um, and I still, we still do and will continue to do that. But now I feel like we do have a degree of expertise and that just wouldn't have happened if we were like more proud or something like that. I would say also uh, sort of my my main piece of advice would be uh, tailor your projects to your opportunities and needs. So it's everything from how much area do you have? If you have a lot of area, it might make sense to make some grazers do the work for you. If you're looking at a few acres, then it's probably easier to go out there and maybe hay the field yourself, you know, um, do you, are you next to other nature areas? If you're not, then maybe you should think about, do you want to essentially plant or seed the area yourself? Or do you have a nature area that's going to do it for you? What kind of soil do you have? Do you have very rich soil? Do you have very poor soil? In one case, you might be better with a forest environment or with something that's heavily grazed. In the other case, uh, you might be better off with something like a wildflower flower meadow. So it's Take some time to get to know your area before you throw yourself into a project and always think about, you know, how much, how much money do I have to throw after this? Because do you, can you afford to throw up a fence or is this going to be something where you're more willing to do labor intensive work, but at a lower cost? So think about all these considerations before you go into it, but do go into it. Don't be intimidated by it. You know, think a bit about what's the best way to rewild and then just go do it and you'll learn along the way as well. Thank you guys. I think Julia, th those were your questions, no? Yes, that's it. And uh, amazing answers. And uh, I'm just so happy that we have such a diverse audience as well uh, that can maybe learn from of the UK situation where we know the rewilding movement is very big, but after Jack and our presentation, you see that it's really just about, uh, you know, go out and do it, as well as Soren, which is a different kind of setting in a more private uh, land. But at the end of the day, well, you guys had almost the same advices. So we are uh, we are all in, the, in this together. Um, just to put, uh, what is this, High School Musical? Yeah, anyway, I leave back to you, Kyle, to uh, then see if there are questions from the, from the audience. Yeah, let's. Uh, I think it's important, and I'm sure Julia agrees to give the room to to everyone here to to ask or comment on anything you heard today. Um, so if anyone has anything they want to ask, mention. Uh, just raise your hand, and then you, you can have the floor. Okay, I have a raised hand. I just can ah uh, here. Felix, I'll unmute you and then you can uh, ask whatever you want. The floor is yours. All right. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, so you mentioned that in the UK, rewilding is really picking up and it's becoming really, really popular. And it's also something I noticed. And I really do we have any idea why that is, because it seems strange to me uh not to shame the uk that in the uk of all places it's, it's becoming such a big movement uh movement because uh for example germany is also pretty 
in a bad state nature-wise, but I think UK is probably even even worse because of the island situation and all that. But in Germany, rewilding is basically non-existent or it's just really slowly starting to pick up. So why do you think in the UK it's mm -hmm. picking up so so fast? It would be really interesting to me. Yeah, such a good question. It's definitely something that we've spoken about a lot because it feels like it's kind of come out of nowhere, even in the time we've been in environmentalism. Like we, we went from hearing the term to it being like a kind of mainstay on major media outlets within only a few years, basically. Um, and I feel like one instinct I have in trying to answer that is that it's one of those things where the answers almost contain in the question, because I think it's it's like partly because of how horrific the UK's natural uh, intactness has been. I think this, a stat people sling around is that the UK is in the bottom 10% on Earth in terms of its biological intactness index, which is like a thing the Natural History Museum did a few years ago. Um, and then there's no rivers. I I don't maybe no I can save the day on this stat, but there's something about how none of the rivers of the UK are like over a certain environmental agency health standards. So just like apocalyptic scenes, basically. And I see rewilding, at least in part, being a response to this being pushed so far down this intensive agriculture path. Um, one other thing I would say is that when we speak to other people in the UK who really care about this, they often cite these core texts over and over again. Um, so George Monbiot, Farrell comes up all the time, and just George Monbiot more broadly, because he's just all, always writing articles about it. And then obviously Nep and Isabella Tree and the book Wilding and this new book that's just come out. Um, and there's also a lot of other really vociferous people in the scene who are just like really good writers and have played like a noticeable role in shifting the conversation. So I'd say it's partly a reaction to the carnage and then partly a few like really like impressive individuals who I think move the conversation. That would be my instinct, anyway. All right. Thank, Thank you for the insight. Thank you, Felix. Great question. Anyone else? Yes, Melanie, I'll unmute you now. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you all so much for your presentations. It was really inspiring. Um, my name is Melanie. I work at Arc Rewilding Nederland. Um, I also see that there is a lot of momentum for rewilding uh, with young people. Um, and I'm actually uh, curious, uh, Jack and Noah, you started as a group of friends uh, and you started uh, to rewild uh, um, in the UK. But do you now also work with volunteers and how do you coordinate your volunteers and how do you keep them involved? Yeah, this is a great question. We kind of, um, yeah, so we, we, we started as, as just being a group of friends and kind of learning. And right now what we're trying to do is kind of recreate that process for like other young people. So yeah, we work with like loads of amazing volunteers from the UK. Um, in terms of for the European Young Rewilders, we've got a great telegram help mm -hmm. set up by Julia, which is, you know, which is awesome. Um, and then we've generally like just used our social media presence as a bit of a um, platform for getting young people involved, which I think is really important and something that other organizations do just really struggle with. Like mm -hmm. when you speak to some older organizations and they, they actually can't really reach young people. But generally we put out an Instagram post of, you know, in two weeks. Well, in in next week, we're um building an outdoor classroom on one of our sites. And we just mm -hmm. put out a post on Instagram and like 20 people are coming to help us build it. Um and that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, which is pretty awesome. Um and then we're slowly kind of getting better at having a more formal system where some each of our projects are having like local um kind of champions i guess associated with each one where maybe they get a bit more responsibility and they're going to have a job title and yeah we want to hopefully try and give some people some money where like we can and you know, change the way that uh, this is done but um, it's yeah we're still learning a lot i think about how to how to deal with like so that we do get so many people approaching us who want to be involved and like, mm -hmm. finding the right job for the right person at the yeah. right project is, is quite hard yeah all right, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Melanie. Anyone else?
if not, maybe I can ask a question for certain because I was wondering during your presentation, you mentioned, um, I think it was one of the questions that uh, one of the struggles was that, you know, lawfully you can't do everything with every piece of land, uh, which I think is the case in a lot of Europe. I didn't know it was so strict that if something is, is open, it needs to stay open. Is there anything legally that could change that you could do to change that or is it really set in stone this is supposed to be forest so it better be forest so we're, we're looking at a few options uh there are some cases where there's nothing to do until the law changes uh, there is certainly discussion to change the law uh, that's in progress so hopefully uh this is just a question of time and we'll be able to move away from this but there are there are a few options available to us so for example you can move over if your site ends up being quite biodiverse or, or, or quite interesting, you can end up getting it protected under Danish law. Now that imposes a whole other slew of problems on us because the, the nature protection law is also a bit not great for rewilding projects, but it, what it can do is it can say, all right, we have an open area. We're okay with it growing, overgrowing a little bit if it's protected and supports biodiversity, but then you need to keep it at that state of overgrowth. So then it can't overgrow further. So we can move from one state to another, but under the law, we either have to be in state number one or state number two. We can't be in between. We can't be moving towards some other state. It has to be static. And that's kind of a problem with the mindset of nature, I think in general, is that a lot of conservation mindset is static. It's saying, we don't want the conditions to change. We want to keep it exactly as is. And that's just not how nature works. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I found it interesting because the whole point of rewilding is that nature does what it wants. But if the law says nature can't do what it wants, then you hit a wall. But no, interesting. Thank you. Anyone else? Although I... I oh, sorry. sorry yes. I will just add, um, which... There's definitely that aspect of rewilding, but I think sometimes it's a little overstated uh, because as a manager, especially when you're working with a smaller uh, project like this, you can actually, grazing is, for example, like a valve, you can turn it kind of off, uh, on, uh, up and down. You know, you want things to get less overgrown, you can introduce more browsers, you can increase the grazing pressure. And even though we would love to have a big project where we can just let grazing be at natural levels where, you know, uh, the population is self-regulating. That's just not practical at a small scale. So you can you can actually play a lot with the natural processes. And that's kind of one of the approaches we want to take. Makes sense. Thank you. Anyone else who has any questions or comments? Well, just a very quick comment to what Soren just said. Um, well, I'm, of course, a bit biased because I do have background in law, as I already said many times, as some of you might know. But this is also something you can do for rewilding if you don't, you know, have land to rewild or you can't go out and rewild land because of different reasons. Um, you can support uh, policy-wise. You can ask your municipality. Uh, you can push for changing these laws. So if any of you that is listening right now find themselves more of a uh, this kind of person and see themselves more in general uh, better for this kind of contribution this is equally important and we just heard an example of why this is important thank you julia yeah, i think it's a good point uh, we looked at, at practical rewilding examples today which is of course a vital part but there are a lot of people who don't have land and can still contribute in ways like that Anything else, guys, before we finish up from anyone? Yeah, Felix. There you go. Or was that an accident? Uh, no, no. Uh, I just have a quick question for Søren uh, concerning the bracken and the boar, uh, because I was really perplexed when you said that you don't have uh, boar in Denmark. Uh, is it also due to some legislation? Are they just shot? Because I, like even in northern Germany, there are lots of them. And I imagine yes. they will be crossing the border. So are you just shooting them all or what's what's happening there? So Denmark is the so the important background here is Denmark is the biggest per capita exporter of pork. So African swine flu is a huge point of paranoia uh, for the industry. So 
wild boar, and I, I don't believe the data actually backed this up, but there is essentially a conception that wild boar can carry African swine uh, swine flu from one plantation to a, uh, one production facility to another. And so the government has essentially, well, first of all, they've erected a boar fence on the southern border to try and keep up boar. And then they're essentially shops if they turn up somewhere in the country. Uh, we do have them at a few uh, rewilding projects in the country. D Danish re rewilding projects are always fenced. It's um, That's essentially just uh, the way it works here. Uh, they have to be fenced. So wherever wild boar are introduced as part of the project, they can't spread outside of the area. So they're only found in those areas. And they're incredibly hard to, um, to get permission to have in a rewilding project as well. And that's why we're looking at pigs rather than uh, wild boar as well. Wow, okay. Well, that's, that's kind of crazy, honestly. <laughs> but, but yeah, thank you. Are there also any pig farms on Bornholm? So would there be any chance that um, yeah, pigs on pig farms could be infected with African swine flu? If, you would, if there would be swine flu in Bornholm, which isn't the case, probably. Uh, yeah, I mean, our neighbor, one of our neighbors are, uh, have a pig farm. It's just 100 meters away. They're everywhere in the country. Um, the, the countryside actually often stinks of, uh, of pig manure because it also uses fertilizer. So it's just, it's everywhere in the Danish countryside. It's, it goes into, and it goes so deeply into policy as well. But since, you know, if we introduced uh, pigs to our rewilding site, it would be again be in a fenced area. So that hopefully shouldn't be an issue. The problem with pig fencing is it's ridiculously expensive. So it's something like, Five or ten times more expensive than standard cattle fencing. So, you know, if you're if you're looking to do rewilding in a fenced area with pigs, you're looking at a much much higher cost, and that is unfortunately a deterrent for many projects, uh, which is a shame because wild boar pigs are incredibly important ecologically. They're essentially the species a species that plows up the earth and helps essentially establish uh, new plant species in a, in an area. Thank you. Anyone else who has any questions? No? All right, guys. Then, uh, first of all, um, the presenters of today, uh, thank you so much for the, for the fantastic initiatives that you presented today. I think it's truly inspiring. Um, not just for for me uh, personally, but to everyone here. Um, really, really great stuff. Um, and two fantastic showcases of how you can contribute um, in the positions that I think most of us in this in this call are in. Uh, you don't need to have a massive national park or 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 governments behind you uh, to already make an impact. And I think that's one of the main takeaways of of both presentations. You can contribute in this case in with with actual rewilding on the ground with with landscapes involved um and then there are so many other ways to to contribute and this is one of them but no matter what you do as, as small as it is everything contributes to the cause that we all stand for and i think that that's vital and the more people we get on board the stronger we get and and the better we we can move forward um with with rewilding and and hopefully uh, make the future a bit brighter, not just for ourselves, but also for for generations to come. Uh, so thank you so much, guys, for for the for the presentations. Um, and um, I think then we can call it a day. I don't know if Julia has any uh, final words uh, for us today. Um, I just wanted to conclude by saying that if you're not yet a member of the European Younger Wilders and uh, you are below 35, you're very welcome to, to join. I posted the link in the chat and I will uh, do it again. Um, if you are based in the UK, uh, then that's even better because you can actually go and help out uh, Noah and Jack. Um, you can do it by contacting them directly uh, with at their initiative website, or you can become a member of the European Younger Wilders and then you will be redirected to the uh, Telegram channel where they um, organize uh, for, the, for the projects. So 
yes, that's that's it from uh, from my side. And I also want to thank all of you, uh, both speakers and audience, uh, to be here. I really hope that was a chance to get some inspiration, and or at least uh, some uh, some motivation. Um, so yeah, that is uh, that is it. I don't know if anyone else wants to add some last words or. I just want to say thanks for organizing all this and uh, thanks everyone for uh, for listening to us. Thanks, thanks guys. guys for having us, guys. It was great. Everyone, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a great evening. Ciao. Yeah. <laughs> Bye.